We call our ranch the Brown Ranch. Where are we going to go work today? We are in Ammonsville, Texas, about 10 miles north of Schulenburg and about 10 miles south of LaGrange. Kind of in between, just north of the coastal prairie, just south of the balconies uplift, Blackland Rolling Prairie. Well, I think probably most of our neighbors call our property overgrown. A friend of my brother came up here one time and I said, well, I'm not going to have cows. And she said, well, you're going to have to mow all this then. I said, no, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> To me, I walk out in the grassland, I like to look at the structure. What does it look like? Can an animal move through that? Does it have nesting cover? And saying, that's what I want our land to look like. I just love living here, really do. I feel like we're blessed. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that yeah, special? Yeah, there's that one. That is, it just looks like a lunar landscape. It looks like sand. It does. There's nothing there. So when we first bought this property, it had been grazed intensively. There was virtually nothing taller than the tops of your shoes. I mean, it was just, the grass was all gone. And if we'd have known better, we'd have probably said, well, we don't want that. But we really liked the views because of this rolling prairie. It never started out as we want to do a restoration, but through websites like AgriLife and Parks and Wildlife, I started learning more about the area, and once that seed got planted, it became a passion that I, I can't describe. <laughs> the journey became, now we're here, what are we doing, and why are we doing it? But then there's a road that goes back to their camp house. Uh, that would be a good fire break. Probably my favorite tool would be fire. Just, uh, I like to see how quickly it changes things and then how quickly it responds to it afterwards. And it's always interesting because it's really never the same, that the winds are different and whatever you're burning may be different, but it's really educational, it's very fun. <laughs> it's been about two weeks since the burn? Yeah, it was two weeks ago Sunday. It had a lot of green in it. I didn't think it would burn very well, but I think it did really well. These prairie systems and savanna systems that are in this area, they're disturbance dependent. So when you rest, it's going to transition away from a prairie or from a savanna into probably a woodland or in worst case scenario to a non-native grass system. And so the work they do is imperative if we're going to keep Texas looking like Texas and, and keep the species that have been here historically existing on this landscape. This is Atlantic camas or wild hyacinth. We call it an indicator plant. And usually what it indicates is that this area has not been continuously heavily grazed or plowed in some time. This plant is a compass plant, and so it's a perennial prairie plant. It's interesting because it, in most of the geographic or plant atlases, it's not listed for Fayette County, but this is the very southern end of its range. When we started surveying this area, we found a load of plant diversity and a species richness. So over 180, 200 species of plants on the property, most of them not found in, in the surrounding area. Prairie pinstemon, or prairie beard tongue, that's bumblebee food. There's about 20 different species in Texas, but that one exists here. It's a good indicator of a tall grass black land prairie. Texas is a prairie state. From the cattle drives that we're known for to where we want our independence on the San Jacinto battlefield, it's like they're intertwined with what Texas is and what Texas is about. And so we have to make a decision that are we going to do the work that's necessary to maintain them. Bison and fire were the two primary disturbances on this landscape for some 20,000 years. That's what I'm trying to mimic. My neighbor, who has about 50 acres next door, he was grazing, leasing it to somebody, and, and they were using it too much. <laughs> and so I called him up one day and I said, would you lease me your land? And he said, but you don't have any cows. And I said, well, I'll get some. Never really had this great desire to be in the cattle business, but it's a great tool. I want the cows to be fat, happy, and the habitat to be managed properly for the benefit of the wildlife. 
So Mark's always had his passions, and, and his passion now is, is his grasses. You know, I find that spraying, spot spraying, individual plant treatment of old world blue stem, very relaxing. It is therapeutic. Terrell will tell you I've done it for hours. He's definitely, I would say, obsessed. <laughs> I like to say I'm committed, or should be committed. <laughs> Here we go cutting mesquite today, mesquite today, mesquite today. On a small pasture, it's hard to have a huge impact. And we need other people to manage in a similar fashion. Perfect. Yeah, it's probably overgrown more so than other people's property, but we prefer it because it's all of the things that nature needs and all of our wildlife needs. To me, the land ethic is to be a part of the landscape. Changing that mindset where people want to be a part of the land rather than to dominate the land. It just seemed like the right thing to do, and it's also, in a lot of ways, easier. A lot of people might look at this as wasted grass. <laughs> it's not wasted. The wildlife are using it, so it's not wasted.